Hello, listeners. You may be wondering what on earth is going on on today's episode of What on Earth is Going On, because I'm clearly not your awesome host, Ben Charland. For those of you who may not know me, my name is Zaya Tong. I'm an author and science broadcaster and former guest of Ben's. And today I have the great honor of interviewing Ben for his 100th show. So Ben, welcome. How does it feel to be a guest on your own program? It feels odd only because I always say, Zaya Tong, welcome to the program, right? And that's the kickoff. <laughs> and then you say something. And then for a hundred episodes now, I've done that. So it's wonderful to hear your voice. It's wonderful to be here with you. But it's certainly, uh, I've never been on the other side of this before. So it's going to be can fun. You, I'm excited. Can you welcome yourself, please? Ben Charland, welcome to the podcast. Thank That's you so great. much. It's great to be here. <laughs> okay, well, you know, I think your viewers all know, or you're not your viewers, I'm a TV person, so your listeners all know that you're a brilliant interviewer and, you know, you do tons of research, but everything comes off as really off the cuff and relaxed when you're doing your interviews. And that is an art form. So, like, how did you get into interviewing? Is this something you've always loved doing? Or, like, how did you hone your skills? I, my first ever interview uh, in, of this kind was for the podcast. Uh, it was episode number one with Keith Banting talking about populism. He was a, he's a Queens professor of uh, political science. And it was, yeah, that was my first ever interview of this kind. I had done other interviews for research before. Um, but I think from the beginning, I wanted to have a proper conversation. Uh, the impetus for the podcast in many ways was the the chance to give myself uh, time with individuals like yourself to talk about their expertise, to talk about their world, to talk about their study. Because if you find that there's an author in a cafe or a professor that you've always wanted to talk to or a musician, whatever, and you approach them, well... <laughs> what are the chances they're going to say, yeah, have a seat. Let's talk for an hour. That never happens. And it's inappropriate, impolite um, for obvious reasons. But with a podcast, <laughs> I have the ability to say exactly that. Hey, can we talk for an hour? And then if they say why, I can say, well, because I have a bunch of listeners who would like to hear it. And it's irrelevant that I'm really the one who just wants to have a good conversation about an interesting subject with someone who really knows what they're talking about. So that's, I mean, I, I guess that's a, an angled answer to your question of how did I start interviewing? But I guess my answer to that would be, I never came in with a presupposition that this was an interview show. And I never came in trying to be really good at it because I was just trying to have a good conversation with people. So if it's working, maybe it's because I'm not trying so hard. I don't know. Yeah. Well, you're certainly good at it and you're, you know, so genuinely curious. So it's, it's been two years now. It's been 100 episodes. So what we're going to do today is we're going to take some of your listeners' questions and we're going to play some highlights over the last few years, okay? We're going to drill deeper into the brain of Ben Charland, hopefully without giving you a lobotomy. <laughs> so <laughs> you have really clearly some very dedicated listeners. We've got so many, so many um, responses. So you should be happy to know that they're not all bots out there. So we want to start with where you are right now. So remember when you and I last spoke, we were face to face. We were in Bloor Street. We were in a cafe. Now we're in the middle of a pandemic and you live in the Yukon. So one of your listeners, Jody M., wants to know, how has your approach to podcasting changed because of all of this? Because of the pandemic and the move to the Yukon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, everything is remote now. So one of the big things for me was to have in-person, real conversations where the body language and the, that silent exchange is happening. Um, and so when the pandemic hit, obviously, I had to adjust. But the lucky thing for me is, is I had done a ton of episodes before leaving Ontario. In fact, I had done enough episodes to take me up to, I think, June or July of 2020. Um, so it, I almost had like a six month break from having these conversations. I was still editing the episodes and promoting them. Um, but in terms of doing the conversations, I had a long break during the pandemic. So that was just luck. Um, 
doing these remote conversations, there is something definitely different about it. Part of it being that you can't hold someone's attention with your eyes. Um, I can, in a conversation with someone, sit across from a table, whether it's in a cafe or their office, and show them that I'm 100% focused on them. I'm not even looking down at my notes. I'm in their eyes. So if they want to go and look at their phone, which they never do, or look out the window <laughs> or be distracted, well, that's a bit humiliating and they're not going to do it. And so I have this opportunity to, to control their attention and vice versa. They can do the same to me. But on a Zoom call, you can't do that. You're missing the opportunity to make sure, are they actually looking at me or are they on their Facebook? Um, and that that's a bit of a struggle. I, I mean, I'm not judging guests on what they're doing while they're talking to me, but I know that when I'm in a Zoom call, and I haven't done it yet, Zaya, I've gone to like look at something just because I'm on a computer and that's how I, that's my paradigm of being with a computer. So that's a bit of an issue that interferes with conversation. I haven't seen any evidence of it yet, but I haven't done that many episodes. Um, yeah, don't so worry. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not tweeting as we're doing this <laughs> right now. Yeah, you're tweeting, oh, man, I'm in this brutal Zoom call. It's I'm like a webinar. Yeah. Okay, so, so uh, the other question that Jody M. has, though, is like, okay, so you've, you've had this time, you, you banked all these episodes, but somehow you, you're also writing a book as, as well. So, so how's that coming along? Uh, I'm working on several different projects. Uh, there's probably the one that she might be referring to because I, I think I know this is the Jody that you're talking about. Um, that's a multi-year project and I would love to get it finished. I mean, it would be great if I could get it finished by the end of the year. That's one of the deadlines that I've set for myself, but it's a, it's a personal project and it's got a lot of, um, personal history. And so overcoming those obstacles have always been more challenging than I expected because it's not just simply writing it out. Although if I were to ask for advice, I'm sure the advice I'd be given is just write the damn thing and then yeah. I'd have it. Yeah, you've interviewed so many authors. So, you know, is it top secret? Can you tell us what your book is about? No, it's not top secret. It's a book about my mom. Uh, she passed away about uh, 10 and a half years ago uh, in 2009. She was a quadriplegic um, and was rendered a quadriplegic in an accident well before I was born. So I was born to a woman with quadriplegia. Uh, she was a woman in a wheelchair with a really fascinating story. She was 17 when she got into this accident, but then put herself through school, uh, became an educated, thoughtful not only member of society, but, uh, but very inspiring person for all of her family and friends and lived as close to a normal life as she could to the point that if you talk to anybody that knew her, being in a wheelchair was like sixth or seventh or eighth thing you'd mention when describing her. And certainly for me, that's the only person I ever know, knew as my mother. Um, it wasn't a factor. So part of the impetus for that book was, well, am I missing something? Who was she? Um, and what courage did she have that maybe me as her son took for granted? Um, but this, this has been in my mind for years now, which is probably giving me hiccups on the path as well. But um, I know that there's a, I know that there's a book there that millions of people would need, would want and need to read. Uh, and I don't mean to say that because I'm writing it. I mean to say that because that's my mom. And so if I write it and only a few people want to read it, well, that's, not, that's my failing and not, not her life, obviously. And so I think that gets in my way as well. So I guess I'm talking more about the obstacles than the thing I'm writing. But um, yeah, that's, well, that's think, probably the know, book she's referring to. It sounds like an incredible book and a true tribute to your mom. I can understand why when you're doing something that's a tribute to somebody else, it's more about them. You want to be able to make it as, as good as possible. But you're right when you said that that first bit of writing advice is always to just write it and really keep uh, everybody else's ideas and thoughts and projections about how it will be received completely out of your mind. Because, Including uh, my own, especially. Oh, 100%. <laughs> absolutely your own. So... You have covered a lot of topics, right, in your podcasts. I mean, you do talk to authors very often. Um, you cover politics, science, gender issues, race. Um, so Bodes, Bodes wants to know, what have you learned most from 99 episodes about people in general? 
I would say, well, maybe my answer on this is slanted because the 99 people I've spoken to, it's actually more than that. There are a few episodes that didn't air for various reasons. Um, and I think that it's skewed because these are very curious, interested, um, thoughtful people. And that's why I asked them to be on the program, obviously. Um, but I think that they're still representative of a greater curiosity amongst people, that people are genuinely and fundamentally curious. They want to know. That's wired deep within us. Even if we're feeling despair about, say, the environment or politics, I think that it's still a real deep drive to understand what's going on, what on earth is going on. Um, you know, even the question, where do we come from and why are we here? Uh, those questions also fit into this drive to be curious. And I think that everybody is an example of that. And I think that the fact that people listen to this podcast, uh, not just appear on it, is testament to human curiosity. So I think I didn't, I don't think I would have said that two and a half years ago when I started this project. I really don't think I would have had so much faith in human curiosity. Maybe I would have uh, cut the pie uh, a lot smaller in that respect. Well, one thing that I really like is that, um, you know, you go through some of these really big questions, but sometimes you go really off tangent or you let your guests go really off tangent as well. So I thought maybe I'd play a clip from our conversation um, when we had our chat because I loved it because it completely went off the rails, but, but we had a lot of fun. Let's have a listen. If there are ghosts, like, why are there no ant ghosts? Why are there no hippo ghosts? Why are there, like, you know what I mean? Like, why are there no beetle ghosts and bird ghosts? You would think, given the profusion of life that we have in the world and all that, you know, there would be ant ghosts freaking everywhere. Yeah, all these ants with unfinished I know. <laughs> <laughs> but you never see them. So that's something that made me go, huh. Still so silly. So of course, there's no ghosts in my book. There's no ants in my book. You know, when I do press rounds as an author, people typically ask me about, you know, very specific stuff. I, I think a lot of the time it's because people don't have the time to, to research as much as you do. Like sometimes on a daily show, I, I've met with people who never even read my book, whereas I, I really got the sense I knew that you knew exactly what the reality bubble was about. Now, we've obviously become friends because we had such a trippy, fun conversation. So how many of your friends or how many of your guests have become friends now that you've done this and you've had these you know, pretty deep conversations, weird conversations with all these people? Yeah, I would say that there's a handful of guests, uh, maybe more than that, maybe more like a dozen guests who I've maintained contact with and I only met them through that way. And that has been really, really helpful for me um, to know that this is more than just uh, a transaction, like a business transaction. Obviously, there's Uzziah, like but there's also... keep talking to you afterwards. Pardon me? I said that they like you enough to keep talking to you afterwards. Yeah, yeah that's right. They don't just say, can you please <laughs> never air that conversation and also never talk to me again. That was embarrassing. Um, no, one of them was uh, Michael Kaufman, actually, who we did a conversation about gender equality. So he's a Toronto-based author um, who has been working for... Uh, as, a, as a man for gender equality and talking about how men can be involved in the gender equality revolution uh, for decades now. He actually worked with Jack Layton back in the 1990s. Um, and Michael and I have kept in touch and he's been really um, helpful in some of the questions that I've uh, had the chance to ask him. And we've, we've seen each other a couple of times since our conversation. So that's been good. I mean, there's other examples of that, but it is nice to know that this isn't, because when you have a really genuine, authentic, thoughtful, and provocative dialogue with somebody, that's just the beginning. I mean, when, mm. the, when I pressed end on our conversation, I wanted that to be the beginning of future dialogue, obviously. Um, yeah. And I think that it's like theater, right? When the curtain goes down, hopefully that's when the play really begins because that's when the lights come up and you start talking about it and talking about the implications for your life and what it means for tomorrow and not just the three hours you spent today. So in other words, it's not just entertainment, it's life-changing. And many and of the so conversations I've had have been life-changing. And it's a ripple effect, right? Like you have conversations with other people and other people listen to your conversations and have conversations with other people. Yeah, so, absolutely. 
Speaking of which, I'm going to get back to some of your listeners here. Vincent St. Pierre has a few questions for you. Firstly, do you have a favorite episode? Oh, I can't say that. I'm like a oh. late night talk show host um, <laughs> who, who can't possibly answer that question. Really? Uh, but I certainly, no, because I, I would say that all of them cumulatively have given me a response to what on earth is going on. But I will say that there are some of the, the podcast conversations that I've done that have really stuck with me and, and it continue to make me think and make me question um, the world around me. One of them would be uh, Antonio Nicazzo. Uh, who I did a conversation with about the mafia. So he's a Queen's University professor who is an expert in the mafia, organized crime. Actually is from Italy and has a backstory himself about the mafia. He wasn't part of it. In fact, he was on the opposite. He, he was working against it and had to flee for his life and continues today to not live in fear, which is one of the things we talked about in that conversation, but know that there are people who would rather have him dead because of the things he says about the mafia. And really all he's doing is bringing it to light and saying, here's something that you don't think about properly because you've romanticized it with The Godfather or Goodfellas or The Irishman or the many films and books and TV shows about the mafia. And th th there is a real thing happening here that you're missing and it's hiding in plain sight. It's going past you every day. And in fact, the mafia itself has changed because of the pop culture of the mafia mobsters wear mafia clothes now there's yeah. there's no dress code for the mafia when it first emerged it was just organized crime but now they've received our own pop culture reflection of it and modified their behavior accordingly but even that is not the important part the important part is that organized crime costs us billions of dollars every year takes lives ruins governments, causes corruption, and uh, erodes the trust in our institutions. And yet, we, we care more about the clothes they wear. Could I make a little suggestion here for you know, future potential episodes? Because a good friend of mine, uh, Jake Edelstein, he actually, he's an author who writes about the Yakuza in, in Japan which are the mobsters there. And it would be interesting actually, because to see what on earth is going on in different parts of the planet with similar sorts of topics, right? Like if you took the Italian mafia, what's going on in say Russia versus, versus Japan. Anyway, that's a bit of a tangent. Let me run back now to the uh, other question that Vincent has for you, which is you have conversations about politicians and politics nearly every second or third episode, he writes, but never, save one example, a politician on the podcast. Why, Ben? Why are politicians bad at speaking to being a politician? And on <laughs> why, why are you not inviting politicians on the show, is I think the question. I have a very specific answer to this question um, because I did a conversation with Kent Hare, who's a friend of mine, a uh, former member of parliament for Calgary Centre, former federal cabinet minister for the Liberal government. And uh, the key word there is former. That's why I asked him to be on the podcast because he's no longer serving as a politician. So when I did that conversation, I actually wrote a newsletter and, uh, and, and talked about why I made this choice early on never to have a serving elected official on the podcast. And um, the, the reason for that is quite simple. It's because a politician has an agenda that, mm. they, that it is their job to not deviate from. You have an agenda when you're talking about the reality bubble to come on the podcast and sell copies of your book, but that's not an overriding agenda. You can have a good conversation with me and not ruin the selling of your books, right? In fact, it might even enhance it. Uh, it might even go further to that objective, but a politician has to stay in these narrow confines because if they don't and they go beyond it, well, not only are they not doing their job, but they could lose their job because it, there is such a, a careful and precise um, tracking that we do of politicians, fair or unfair, but it means that you can't have a genuine dialogue with a politician, or if you can, that would be the exception as opposed to the rule. And I'd rather not go digging to find the one politician who's willing to speak openly and candidly with me and be willing to make a mistake, be willing to say something, oh, you know what, actually, Maybe that was the wrong thing to say, and let me rethink that. If you say that in the podcast with me, that's interesting. 
No one's going to say, I'm not going to buy her book anymore because she said something silly. I mean, that's our job to say things silly, but for a politician, the rules are so clear. And I just, I, I don't think that, it's not about doing their job um, for me. Like, it's not like I don't want to bring them on the podcast because I don't want to uh, carry their political banner. It's more because they can't put that banner down because if they do, there are consequences. Um, that, I mean, there are more facets, uh, facets to that reasoning, but generally that's the main thing there. And so it's unfortunate because we do talk about politics a lot. Wouldn't it be good to talk about the real experts who are doing this work every day? Yeah, but I don't think I'm going to get real conversations out of it. So Vincent, if you're a politician, Ben is never inviting you on the show, <laughs> basically. Oh, Vincent, Vincent is not elected. I know Vincent. And <laughs> oh, he, you do know Vincent. Yeah, he's okay. not an elected official. So he, may, he probably will be one day. So he better oh, get on the okay. podcast before he is. So Moira, next up, wants to know, who has been your greatest teacher outside of a classroom? My greatest teacher outside of the classroom would have to be my mom. I would, I mean, there's no question about that. Um, my mom taught me dignity uh, and respect for all people, no matter where they come from. But on the flip side of that, a really cutting, fascinating, and never-ending funny sense of humor um, that, that is sometimes targeted, that sometimes is satirical. And it's okay to be the butt of the joke because it makes us, it lifts us all up a little bit. Mm. Um, so there was certainly that, the sense of humor, being thoughtful, having respect for others, but the constant debate that I had with my mom, which was probably my fault as much as it was hers, that every time we were together, we were just fighting, um, sharpened my mind, but also showed me that there is something to be gained from that. There's a, a productive imagination that occurs in antagonistic discussion. Um, when, you know, you're, you're fighting over something and, you know, maybe it's just a j debate in the sense that you're not, you're not really taking a position you personally believe in, but just for fun, I'm going to play the devil's advocate. And I learned a lot from her about that um, because she was a very extremely sharp person and loved language, loved discourse and would, you know, when I wrote something would say, why are you using that word twice? Surely there's a better word you can use. I don't remember any teacher saying that to me. Mm. I think her, her insight on that was a step beyond what any teacher was ever working with me individually on. Yeah. I think it's going to be a beautiful book. I can't wait to read it. See the pressure? I know. I know. We'll, we'll talk more about that. We'll yeah. talk more about that offline too. Okay. So one thing that I have noticed uh, in terms of your podcast is that it often really reveals what's going on beneath what we think is going on. And, you know, in a sense, your guests are like teachers in, in the classroom of the real world. So you, you did an interview with Carlos Prado on the digital age. And he talks about how just everyday objects in a capitalist society have uh, sometimes a greater meaning. So let's roll that clip. My, my concern is that people don't pay enough attention to how fads and fashions influence them. For instance, you now can buy an electric razor that will leave a three-day growth on you. Why? Hmm. My view of this is that as women became more assertive, men began, began to feel they needed to confirm or assert their own masculinity, and hence the beards. Nobody considers that when they let themselves run around with a three-day growth of beard. But they're doing it, hmm. and it has become popular enough, as I say, that companies are making razors that do that. Interesting. Okay, so I can see you. You don't have a beard, but shaving is a daily thing. So now that you know that three-day beard stubble is a bit of a marketing con, is that why you don't have a beard, Ben? Like, why? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, how much do you change your behavior, I guess, after having your guests on? Did that okay. change? point of view when it came to beard stubble no but it probably made me feel better about what i do when really i'm i'm influenced without knowing it by marketing and and corporate media and so forth uh i don't have a beard now because i shave once a week 
um, in the summer because I like having my face open. But in the winter, I grow a beard because I live in the Yukon and I need to be warm. <laughs> so it's like, a, it's like just a, a, a natural balaclava that I usually wear in the winter. But that's just my justification. I mean, I still use a razor and shaving cream and I put stuff on because my wife likes the smell of it. And, uh, and sometimes I shave before I do something like this or I'm doing an interview uh, because I need to look more presentable. Certainly, I shave more often than I did in the past. And my mother would be very happy to hear that I'm well-groomed now because I didn't used to be. Um, but I think what's interesting about what Carlo says is like what you said, what's underneath what's really going on. That was episode number two of this podcast. And I remember that moment when he said that. Because I realized, oh, that's what I'm doing with this show. I'm trying to find those moments that reveal what's going on underneath. And it takes philosophers, as Carlos is, or science journalists, as you are, to find that, what's underneath. The reality bubble is actually a great example of this. What's underneath our daily assumption of the world? What's actually going on scientifically in our minds cognitively. Um, and I think that that's why the show's title was actually quite apt, but I didn't realize it until episode number two. What on earth is going on? Um, you could add underneath or why to that question. But I think when you talk about my personal behavior, I don't know. I, I wonder this because psychologists... Well, has anybody ever changed anything? Like, you, Have you ever had a conversation where you got out of that conversation and your behavior changed. Yeah, this is what I'm trying to figure out. I mean, maybe I'd have to go back and see if there are specific things that I changed. There probably are. But here's an interesting idea. Psychologists uh, believe that the, the beginning of change is knowledge, is understanding. Now, this seems like, obviously, we do this when we talk about Black Lives Matter, for example. The beginning of changing the problem is to know that there is one. Alcoholics are on the same page. But a psychologist will tell you that there's actually real brain chemistry and wiring at play there. That you can't, the brain will change its behavior after it is exposed to cognitive knowledge of that behavior. In other words, if I can see myself in a mirror doing something, I might change my posture, change the way that I walk without deciding to change it. In fact, the decision or the knowledge that we've made that decision may not come until after we've actually made it. In other words, it's more of an unconscious shifting of who we are in relation to how we perceive the world. And so that probably has affected the way that I behave and how much I shave or don't shave or how I view beards after having heard that from Carlos. Um, and there are probably many things. I mean, well, here's one specifically with drinking water. Uh, there's an episode I did in the early days with the director of the Queen's University uh, BD Water Research Center. And uh, she talked about the, how, how clean the water is in Kingston, where I used to live, that you should drink this water. It's, it's better than bottled water. Um, and why are people so freaked out about it? Why do people need filters and to buy jugs of water at the supermarket? Why is that? And if they knew that an expert was saying that the, their local water supply was cleaner and safer to drink, would they go and drink it? Maybe not on the first blush, but maybe after 10 times of hearing that, they would. And so that speaks to the importance of hearing what experts have to say maybe more than once. Uh, certainly, I, I always drink from the tap, but it made me feel better about it. Um, but yeah, I think the whole question of water is actually an interesting one before we go on that tangent. But yeah. Well, what I love too, obviously, is of course, you do have experts, you have scientists. And, and we were talking earlier about this, uh, this behind the veil, sort of like lifting the veil is what you're oh. doing. And um, I thought we could play another clip that's a great example of that. Um, this is with Bob McDonald from Quirks and Quarks, and he's really looking at how the, the mind has the power to understand fundamental concepts. So let's take a listen. We need that. You, you need to have a fundamental understanding of things. Like I, I look around and I, I, see, I see patterns. Like just outside the window here, there's a couple of flags that are blowing in the wind. 
Well, that's very nice, you know, but what's going on there? Well, what's really happening is that as the wind goes around the pole, the pole is creating vortices, which are whirlpools in the air, and they're traveling down the length of the flag, first from one side, then the other. They're alternating, and that's what gives the flag that 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 flappy look there. It's, it's, but they're whirlpools of air traveling down from the pole, the turbulence from the pole is, is causing the flag to stick out, and that's why it flaps back and forth. If the turbulence wasn't there, the flag would be just straight out and wouldn't, wouldn't flap. So there's, there's an interesting thing. So I'm talking about aerodynamics, I'm talking about vortices, I'm talking physics, and I'm talking climate, because if the wind wasn't blowing, well, you want to talk about why the wind blows? There's another question. Yeah. So we can keep going and going and going. Right. So I'm doing that all the time, and, and that I find that understanding fundamental concepts of science like that helps me see things. So when, when an issue comes up, then I'll, I'll say, okay, well, I know the principle behind that. So now I can see what the scientist is saying that agrees with that fundamental principle, and then I see this idiot over here that's saying that he or she doesn't believe it because, and they don't have any good reasons. Right. Because I understand the fundamentals. So it's really important for young people that we get the fundamentals to them. So, yeah, I mean, that's obviously why I love science, is it reveals how things work, the sort of machinations of the physical world. Um, but I was interested in what Bob was talking about there, because today we have all these sorts of red pills, right? Like from the matrix where you see the greater reality. But at the same time, there's a lot of other people who claim to be taking the red pill, whether it's the QAnon believers, whether it's the flat earthers, uh, and they also think that they're accessing deeper truths. So what I'm wondering just from you and your opinion is why do you think that's happening? What on earth is going on, Ben? <laughs> like what's happening to, to cause all these mistruths to be construed as truths? You know, what, what's happening with this sort of rise as a rise of idiots without good reasons, as, as Bob puts it? I would say that that is one of the big questions that's uh, being tackled by this podcast and by many journalists and authors out there. It is one of the big answers to the question, what on earth is going on? It's that we no longer live in a society where, at least in the established world, um, there is a shared truth and a received understanding for the way things were. The cliche example is there were three broadcasters in the United States for a long time, CBS, ABC, and NBC. And they were telling generally the same story from day to day with different slants and maybe one of them would get to a story early. But in general, your receiving of the world around you was based on shared understandings. And now in the media, media ecosystem, there is, I mean, dozens of broadcasters in the United States, but no one even watches those anymore because they go and get their news from Twitter and Facebook. Furthermore, what's interesting, and this happened in the era of George W. Bush, I think, just as the internet was not just taking off, but taking hold, was you have comedians making fun of the news, and that became the source of people's news. I love it. I get a lot of my news from John Oliver last week tonight. Um, my wife and I are renting a house that has access to that show, so we won't have it for much longer. But while we do, we watch it every week and we love it. And a lot of my understanding of what's going on is coming from someone who's making fun of it. Now, John Oliver may be an exception because he really goes in depth on these things. And part of what's funny about the show is the angst and the anger and the emotion that comes with it, um, as well as the satire. Maybe those two are actually the same thing. But there's this, as you mentioned, this complete disassembly of the truth and what is reality and therefore how you find a deeper truth. I mean, it's in our language now to live your truth. Well, what does that mean? Surely for an objective person or for a scientist or just a skeptic, there's only one objective truth. I mean, it's the reality that we know. But someone could say, yeah, well, in quantum physics, um, at, the, at, the, at the root level, it's all probability as opposed to one knowable truth. I mean, physicists would disagree with that assessment, but it opens the door for that. And so we live in a world where that is breaking down. And I think that has much more profound impacts than we give it credit for. People will say, oh, yeah, well, journalism is being disrupted. It's not that simple. If journalism is being disrupted, then our whole way of understanding the world is being disrupted. And if that is falling apart, then our ability to solve problems, work together, see each other as human beings, 
and, and fix things will change. I mean, if no one agrees on how a bridge should be built, then the bridge will not be built, or there will be five of them when there should only be one. And we, we get into this kind of ridiculousness, and it, doesn't, it does not seem to be getting any better. And I'll bring in the big name now. Donald Trump is, in many ways, the apotheosis of this, of this current paradigm of misinformation, disinformation, uh, or just a lack of shared understandings. I mean, look at the fact that political parties, and this is particular in the United States, maybe not so profound in Canada, but where Republicans and Democrats see each other as enemies, not opponents. That's, mm. that's a big problem. And that does not seem to be getting any better because that will simply snowball. They benefit from this. Democrats will get more votes if Republicans are the enemy and vice versa. So why not do it even more? Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a long answer to your question, but it is troubling. And, and one of the things I was listening to right when I started the podcast was an interview with Barack Obama, who talked exactly about this, and who said that this is maybe one of, if not the biggest challenge we face as a democracy right now. And that was three years ago. I think that was one of his last interviews while he was in office as president. Well, one of the things, I don't want to take us too off tangent here, but just in terms of this being a conversation, I, I think that it has to do with the fact that there's nuggets of truth um, in a lot of the mistruth. So if you look at something like QAnon, for example, right? Is there child trafficking? Yes. Are our corporate elites controlling things? Yes. Is there bias in the media? Yes. But the thing is, nobody's actually looking at real child trafficking, real issues yeah. to do with, you know, uh, white collar crime and corporate elites or media concentration, right, and conglomeration. Instead, what they're doing is they're chasing these red her herrings. And I just think that that's highly problematic because all of the energy and, you know, unfortunately, anger that people have um, at these kernels and these nuggets of truth are, are actually making them, they're chasing down rabbit holes. But anyway, that is a separate issue. But since we're talking about this sort of conspiracy theory aspect of things, Kim wants to know, <laughs> that was the segue, are there <laughs> any one. specific impacts that you hope your show will have on listeners over the long run? Note, okay, this sounds like social engineering, but I guess what I'm asking is, is there a larger goal of hosting such a wide variety of topics that knits them all together? So Ben, what did you have in mind for this? Yeah, actually, I would say it goes along with what Bob McDonald said in the clip we just played. Um, he was talking about having a deeper understanding of science so that when you're faced with a problem or in conversation with somebody, you have more to draw on. You can think critically, which again is another cliche that we talk about, that we want all high school students and university students to think critically without really imagining what that means. But thinking critically also means thinking imaginatively and thinking broadly, thinking in a wide variety of subjects. Um, being able to understand not all the facts. You don't need to know all the dates. As Eric Hobsbawm, the historian, said, dates are just the, the pegs to hold up the canvas of history. They are mm. not the history itself. They're just the structure to hold it all together. Well, the same thing is true with science. I mean, very few people can do what Bob McDonald did and sit in that cafe in Barrie, Ontario, look outside, and scientifically describe everything that was around him. But... What he's saying is, is to have some semblance of that is important. To know a little bit about the mafia objectively and not just what you receive in movies and television shows. To understand a little bit about what experts think about the water supply. To understand uh, politics from the point of view for, from those who study it for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And how do they think these trends are unfolding? To understand misinformation from a journalist perspective, from a political perspective, from a cultural and anthropolog uh, anthropological perspective, that enhances our understanding of the world. And that is why when a kid who's in grade seven says, why am I studying math? I'm never going to use math in my career which is to be, I don't know, a firefighter or something. It's not about understanding it for your career. The purpose of education is to be the rising tide that ri raises all ships and not just the one in which you're going to be making money. I think that um, if I can have a lasting impact, it is to allow and maybe even encourage for 
a broad, eclectic, Catholic view, to use the true meaning of the word Catholic, Catholic view of the world, because that will make everything better. It'll make you more imaginative, more creative, I think happier, more capable of solving problems, and more interesting in conversation. Okay, so what do you mean by the original meaning of Catholic? Well, just, I mean, the, the word Catholic and the reason the Catholic Church uses it is because Catholic means broad, eclectic, like covers everybody, right? So ah. the Catholic Church is the church for all Christians, and that word Catholic, so if you have Catholic tastes, then your tastes are eclectic. They're all over the place. They're, you, have, you like different kinds of music. To have a Catholic taste in literature means you read Ernest Hemingway and then Isaac Asimov right after. Yeah. Very cool. Okay, so let's move on now to something a little bit more philosophical because two people in Evergreen, Colorado want to know, Ben, would you rather be fluent in every language spoken on earth or be able to play all the musical instruments? Explain your choice. I would probably say musical instruments because I've always wanted to play music and if I were to be born again tomorrow and given another shot, I'd probably want to be a musician or a composer or something like that. And I think just to be able to play them all, yeah, I would, I would go for that. Especially today when I speak the lingua franca, I speak English, I can go anywhere and talk to most people. And if I can't, I've got a phone that I can translate it. I have to have other people play a, an instrument to make me music. Um, so, yeah, I would, say, I would say the latter on that one. I have a totally different response, but okay, I'm Okay, go. Going what's your response? No, 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 what's no, your no. response? Oh, well, I, I would pick every language, and I, I would pick it for a different reason. And I think that's because if I could play all the musical instruments, um, I would certainly be able to play them for other people. But I, I love the interactivity. And I know that speaking, I, I speak more than one language as it is. There are so many nuances and, and ways of thinking. It cracks open your brain when you can think how Chinese people think or think how, how people think in English. And I would love to know how different people think framed by their language. But that's just my, that's just my thought. I, I don't think I there's agree. a right answer No, here. that's a wonderful answer. And I would say, like my wife and I, I've been trying to learn French my whole life. I didn't learn it as a kid, even though I have French heritage. And... Uh, and it's really important to me. But part of the reason I want to learn French is because I want to think in a different way. I want to dream in a different way. Mm. And I think that that is something about language that we miss. It's not just opening doors when you go traveling or getting a different job. You get to think in a different way, in a way that you cannot conceive when you simply think in English. Yeah. Um, and that, that is a, code, a yeah. right? It's a totally different way of programming, you know, the hardware. Yeah. Um, the software. Uh, not, not the hardware. Okay, so next question uh, by two people in Evergreen, Colorado. Ben, which has more power, love or fear? Uh, I would say in the short term, in the short term, fear, and in the long term, love. That's a it, very good answer. I mean, d there's no question that in the short term, you can motivate people through fear and get them to do almost anything. And maybe in the, in the end, especially in our accelerated age, that's all that matters is making people afraid because the, it's just the long term is just a series of short terms. But I think that if we were only fearful, then our 150,000 years, so to speak, of human history wouldn't, it would have ended by now. Uh, we wouldn't have arrived here without love to propel us into an interesting and curious world where we engage with it positively and searching for something more as opposed to getting rid of something we don't like. Okay, so speaking of fear, we're both interviewers. And as interviewers, we know that sometimes things don't go as planned. <laughs> so we've got a, a little clip here that I'd like you to play. But I don't see how that kind of perspective of will mm, be embraced by new audiences. Well, and it's almost a fait accompli, right? Uh, Jen Stevenson, who works in the, in the dance school of drama and music, where we are now, um, has talked about how um, that, that when it comes to live performance, you can't really know the, the difference between liveness and realness, right? And that there's a moment at which when you're on your phone, um, you, it merges with the whole thing. That this, the technology becomes the mediated experience, right? And that, I mean, for her research, which is theater of the real, 
um, and, and sort of documentary drama, which is taking nonfiction and putting it on stage, there's a sense that the more you encounter live performance, even if it's fictional and imaginary, the more you have to be comfortable with the unknown. And there's a certain sense with all of this that, that the digitization of, of theater or live performance is the unknown. We don't know where it's going to go. Okay, so for your listeners right now, as that clip is being played, Ben is making all these sorts of, um, I don't know, he's mouthing, he's, he's laughing. Um, so what on earth is going on, Ben? Oh, God, don't. I don't know why. I put that <laughs> I'm sweating watching that. It's a YouTube clip because we, we did a, that was, okay, so that was an episode of the podcast where we did a live panel of three people in the Dan School of Drama and Music at Queen's University and had an audience, recorded it, not only audio, but also video, put it on YouTube. And honestly, in the middle of it, when that happened, I thought, oh, it's okay, I'll cut it. But all these people who are watching me know, and I'm just spinning in my head. And when I watched it after, it's, it's hard to tell that I'm such a moron. No, uh, no. <laughs> because here's the thing, like, I can tell the very moment that I lost what the hell I was saying. I, I mentioned Jen <laughs> Stevenson because I had an idea, oh yeah, Jen Stevenson said something about this. And then as soon as I gave a little bit of background on who she is, what the hell was I going to say about, oh my God. And then I just spent about a minute fumbling, brought it back. But I, I beautifully brought it back, but it's hilarious. I mean, it's because we all do. I mean, we do that in conversation. We, we forget what we're saying and you know, if you're not in a professional context where people are staring at you, it's completely fine. You could be like, hey, I just lost my train of thought. But I love that you just kept, you kept skating. You kept skating until you reached that, that wonderland that you needed to get to. You know what I mean? You were on the Reno Canal. <laughs> well, the thing is, is I mentioned her name and I had to say something about it. I couldn't just say, you know, that's interesting. And I, the, uh, digitization. And I could have just made up some crap about digitization. But because I had, you know, shoehorned myself into this name, I had to find a way to make it relevant. It was a great though, save, friend. Oh, it was but, a great but, save. But it, maybe I should have done is, you know what? I lost my train of thought. Craig, what do you think? No, because um, then it wouldn't have been memorable. And we wouldn't be putting it on the 100 <laughs> show episode. And it wouldn't be funny. Okay, so have you, are there any bloopers in particular that you recall? One of your, one of your listeners is asking? Uh, that would cert that's not so much a blooper. It's kind of hidden. You might not notice it until I refer to it. Um, so that's certainly one of them. There are others that I've cut. Usually it's long pauses um, in a conversation. I mean, I've lost my train of thought in other conversations, but usually I just catch myself and say, you know what, I've lost my train of thought. We'll cut this part. Or I, or I skate around it. Probably I usually skate around it because, of course, I want the other person to think I'm a genius and think I'm really, really smart and know what I'm doing and talking about when often I don't. Um, but the thing I, is, in that video, Ben, the lady in the video is actually nodding in agreement with you. Oh <laughs> That's God. my favorite part. No, she's, she's just probably, being nice. No, she's nodding in agreement. Okay. Um, moving along, because, uh, because you know, our hour is coming to a close here. I did want to know, though, um, actually, this is another question. What is, the, what is the strangest place that you've ever conducted an interview? You know, you're, you've been a roving podcaster for a long time. You take your microphone with you. Uh, have there ever been any odd places where you've conducted an interview? Uh, let me think about that because there's, I, I'm sure there's a good one. Oh, yeah. Um, so I've conducted interviews in many different places, but usually I try to go somewhere comfortable for the guests, like their office, sometimes even their home. Um, sometimes I record in a cafe when that's not possible. So there's a lot of cafes in Toronto. Obviously the one with Bob McDonald was in Barrie at a cafe. Um, but there was one in Calgary with uh, a theater artist named Andy Curtis, who's a really great, funny actor. And uh, I'd always wanted to talk to him in general, uh, for a good hour and pick his brain, let alone for the podcast. We met at the Theatre Junction Grand, which is a theatre in Calgary, because that's where he was doing a show, Waiting for Godot, um, by Samuel Beckett, which is a play that had a big impact on me. So I had gone to see it, I think the day before, and we agreed to meet at the theatre. Um, and then we were going to actually do the recording, whether it was on the stage or in the audience or in the green room or something. And I show up and he just 
I think blanked not, he knew we were doing this conversation, but he blanked that he had to get access to the theater and we couldn't get it. And I, I hate to expose him like this, but it's actually quite funny because we recorded in the stairwell of the <laughs> That's building. Really, hey. And it was lucky because the headphones that I use and microphones, they, they prevent a lot of echo uh, because the microphone is right up against the mouth. So it's not, the space you're in doesn't really matter. Well, it does a little bit acoustically, but not as much as it would if you had a proper full microphone set up. But we had people come by. We had the kitchen staff <laughs> carrying crap up and down the stairs. Absolutely. And it was funny because there, wouldn't, there wasn't anybody more perfect for that than Andy, who's a professional improviser. And it almost added a flavor and atmosphere to the conversation. But we were really in just like a, an up-down corridor for an operating theater and restaurant. Um, and that was, that was pretty funny. But again, I think that actually added to the experience more than detracted from it. Okay, so you've been doing this podcast now for two years. So what other podcasts have inspired you then, Ben? Yeah, there's a lot. I used to listen to a lot more podcasts when I started this thing, sometimes for enjoyment, sometimes for inspiration and to learn something, and often in between. Um, one of them was um, the Ezra Klein Show. Um, mm. He does long-form interviews with often, and politicians, but uh, public, um, sorry, uh, social scientists, people on the forefront of studying, again, what on earth is going on, but it, it, specific to the American political field, or at least adjacent to that. And his, he's so incisive and, and off the cuff intelligent about the things that he talks about, that not only are you interested in what the guest has to say, you're interested in what he has to say in response. And that allowed me the latitude with this podcast to make it a dialogue as opposed to just me asking questions. That was really important to me. And I, not that I think that I'm Ezra Klein, but that it makes it more, his show is interesting because he jumps in 50% of the time. And you have a conversation between two people who know what they're talking about. So that was a big one. Um, there's a BBC radio show that has been essentially syndicated into a podcast called In Our Time. Um, with Melvin Bragg, and that's a, it's a fascinating panel show where they bring on three guests to talk about any subject. So it's got the breadth that What on Earth is Going On has, and that was an example that I would use to describe what I was doing. It's always confined to an hour because it's a radio show, um, but you have these debates over really esoteric stuff, like the construction of Hadrian's Wall, and two people are passionately disagreeing on when and how it was built. But because of their passion and because of the way that this show is moderated, it brings you into it in a way that maybe dialogue wouldn't and certainly reading a book about it wouldn't because you're carried away by not just the argument, but by the, just the passionate curiosity of people. And the best part about that show is just pick one. It, like, you know, you can go through the list of hundreds and hundreds of episodes and it doesn't matter. Just pick one and you will be within five or 10 minutes interested in that subject. It's, it's by default. So I would say with what on earth is going on, it maybe doesn't have the same thing. Maybe go through the list and pick something that you're interested in. But my hope would be similar to in our time that if you just pick one by random within a few minutes, the passion and proper genuine dialogue that is occurring will bring you into the heart of that subject and make you interested in something you might not have been interested in before. Very true. Very true. I certainly have been listening to your podcast. So, okay, Ben, we have come to near the end of the line here and I saved the, the last question um, is one by your really wonderful and awesome wife, Shalane. Okay. So she okay. wants to know, um, what would you change about the past or do differently in the future when it comes to your podcast? Okay. So, um, first of all, let me say that this is the first question that made me nervous and made me <laughs> flush. No, seriously, you can probably see it on my face. Yeah, but why? That's so strange. Yeah, well, it's my wife and she's asking me what I would change and do differently. <laughs> You know, I'm really, ner but no, at the moment you mentioned her name, I was nervous. Um, so I would, what I would change in the past, I mean, there's a lot of conversations I've had with people about, okay, how can I make this podcast successful, appeal to more people? Um, and I've gone down different avenues of changing certain things, but I've had many, many different kernels of advice. And I honestly don't know which one I would have followed. 
Um, but I would say from the beginning, if I could change something, I would have gone full on proper conversation from the beginning. Um, as opposed, because the first 10, 10 episodes are more interview style before I kind of found my footing in them. Um, but I would also say that something that worked in those episodes that I stopped doing was essentially the essay. So I would spend 10 to 15 minutes in those early episodes essentially reading something that I had written. Um, mm. And it would relate sometimes to the subject at hand. Sometimes it would be, hey, I'm going to talk about VR and a lab in Barcelona that is studying cognition for 15 minutes. And then we're going to talk about the water supply uh, with this person. So having, <laughs> that eclectic, having that eclectic approach in each episode was, was a cool thing. But regardless, having these essays was really cool because people responded to them and really liked them. Um, I think over time, maybe more because of the time pressure on me, I just focused on the conversations. Uh, often the conversations would get close to an hour, and this show is broadcast on the radio as well, on five stations across Canada. And so I wanted to stick to that hour. I've recently just gone over the hour and then edited it down. But I got carried away with the idea that this was a conversation show, as, well, as opposed to a platform for me to read something I had written. But I think that whether that's for this podcast or a different podcast, that is something I wish I had explored more and may explore in the future um, because there is certainly an interest in it and I like to write. Um, it's, and it's different from conversation. So I would say that maybe more than any other thing, but there's lots of things. I mean, um, you know, there are many guests that, uh, that I would still like to have on the podcast um, and no regrets really, but certainly lots of ideas of how I can make this better and more uh, provocative, more insightful, incisive, uh, make you think and change your paradigm. If the, the more I can do that for more people, the better I'm doing at my job. I think you've done that already. So Ben Charland, I do love that your next episode is actually going to be What on Earth is Going On 101, which almost sounds a bit like a university class, you know? Totally. And for me, it's just been great to see your show grow up and, you know, you're offering so much wisdom and you're helping, you know, all of us listeners along the way as well. So thank you, Ben Charland, for all of your insightful, smart, thoughtful interviews. And I look forward to doing this again with you, maybe for episode 200. Oh, man. Zaya, thank you so much. This has been a real privilege and pleasure to sit on this side and to have someone who is such a professional guide me through this. I mean, not only have you done your homework, but this is, you're good. And uh, you, you put me on the spot in exactly the right way. And so thank you so much for not only the previous conversation we did, but obviously for this one and for being a listener and a supporter. Thank you. You know what I'm going to say now, Ben, though. Just uh, as we started this off and you welcomed yourself, I want to thank you as we, I want you to thank yourself as oh, a guest gosh. as we go out. You got to, come on, here we go. Uh, shit, what do I normally say? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, uh, okay, okay, what I would normally, okay. Ben, thank you so much for, <laughs> no, this is ridiculous. <laughs> what am I doing? Okay, okay, I'll get it, I'll get it. Ben, thank you so much for being on the show. It's been a real privilege and a really fascinating conversation. Oh my God. <laughs> now, I, now every ending I've ever done will come across as fake. <laughs> no, it won't. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>